everyone. Hope you're well. Welcome to our digital campus here at Grace Family Church. And we're really excited to have you here this morning. Uh, I'm Wes. And my name is KG. And if you're wondering where Kerry is, Kerry's on holiday in the UK with her family. Yes. And we're wishing her all the best in this time where she can relax and enjoy herself. And to have a good time to rest and to catch up. Living the life. So if you just joined us, we are in week two of our series, Pretty Little Lies. And we've got our co-senior pastor, Tom Person, uh, straight coming out of this clip. Somebody lies. Somebody lies, you see. There never was a president that ever resembled me. But somebody lies. As plain as plain could be. Somebody lies. Somebody lies for me. I would have drowned, but I held my breath and floated to shore, you see. But somebody lies, as clean as clean would be. Somebody lies, yell to choose your bomb, somebody that you gave it to me. I want to paint a picture for you today. A, a picture or a scenario you're probably very familiar with. And that is standing in the grocery store checkout line. And not just the normal aisles, you know, where you get your stuff, but that final aisle that you have to go through, wind your way through to get to the place where you pay. I call it the aisle of death uh, because it's like the ultimate case study in what David Bennett calls a war of loves. I mean, just imagine, there I am, I'm, uh, on my right is a magazine rack and it's covered with beautiful, thin and all muscular celebrities airbrushed to digital perfection. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Timothy Chalamet is stealing the hearts of teenagers the world over. Ryan Gosling is aging nicely. Paul Rudd is not aging at all, apparently. <laughs> my wife once told me, and this is a true story, she said that if I ever died, she was going to marry Ryan Gosling. To which I said, that's fine, as long as that if she dies, I can also marry Ryan Gosling. <laughs> Just a little joke. <laughs> but, but that's on my right, the magazines, okay? You know what I'm talking about. Then on my left, you've got the shelf. The shelf stacked with sugar, chocolate, uh, of course, the impossible to resist chuckles. Um, if you're not a South African, it's like, it's, this is clearly a Woolworths uh, aisle because chuckles are like, it's like 900 Rand for a bag of nine, but it's worth it. Um, the, the point is, as I stand in line, I feel these two kind of deep desires in my soul. On the one hand, I want to look like, you know, Ryan Gosling or the guys on the covers. On the other hand, I want to go home and eat the whole bag of chuckles and not tell Jess about it. <laughs> And people say, you know, follow your heart. But I'm saying, which heart do I follow? And, and what do you do when, what do we do when our hearts are fickle and our desires change, sometimes by the hour and with our moods? When people say, you know, be true to yourself, in some ways I would argue, well, both the desires I feel in that aisle are authentic and true to myself. But here's the truth. They're mutually exclusive. <laughs> As a now 40-year-old guy, I can't have my cake, my chuckles, and eat it too, literally. And so what do I do? What do we do with this kind of existential problem? What do you do? Well, I'll tell you what I do. I grab the magazine, the men's health, and the chuckles, and just for good measure, the yogurt gummies, because they're organic and it's yogurt, so it's healthy, right? And I finish the bag, both of them, before I get home, so Jess won't suspect anything. <laughs> And then I spend the evening reading about Gosling's ab workout routine, which I will start tomorrow, <laughs> right? Now, I know this is kind of like a, a tongue-in-cheek joke, and, uh, but this wrestle that I speak of, it goes far beyond grocery store aisles, and it's true of, a much, more, of much more sensitive and much more serious conflicts of desires in our hearts. I want to love my children well, to be present and an intentional father to my boys, but I also want them to go to sleep so I can watch TV and let them sort out their own annoying problems, right? I want to live grateful and content with what I have and, 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 and exercise radical generosity, but I also want to buy a new pair of shoes that I don't really need. I want to get up early and read my Bible, but I also want to stay up late watching Netflix. <laughs> I could go on and on because this is the very nature of the human experience. We have this wrestle taking place inside of us. Now, if you missed last week, we started a new series called Pretty Little Lies. 
and it's based off the book Live No Lies by John Marcoma, which I'll be quoting a lot today again, and I've already kind of quoted some of his stuff, but this series, uh, uh, Pretty Little Lies, it's all about the lies we believe about ourselves, about others, and even about God. And how those lies, if we let them, can wreak havoc in our lives and in our relationships. And so last week we spoke about the fact that there is a battle going on, that we are at war. And it primarily it's a war between truth and lies. And like I said last week, there's no way out of the fight. The, the choice is not whether we fight or not, but rather how we choose to fight and what weapons we choose to fight with. And that's why the Apostle Paul writes, he says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces of evil. And he goes on to say that the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. So we spoke about these three enemies of the soul, the devil, the flesh, and the world. We said that the enemy's primary tactic, this is so important, it comes out of John Mokomi's book, and it's a really helpful framework that we see from the scriptures. He says the enemy's primary tactic is to tell us lies, deceptive ideas, that play to our disordered desires, which eventually become normalized in a sinful society. Deceptive ideas, that could be the, de that's the devil. Jesus called him the father of lies. We looked at it last week. That play to our disordered desires, the flesh, that become normalized in a sinful society, the world. So we looked at the devil last week, and I want to encourage you again, if you missed last week, go catch up online. It's on YouTube. It's on Facebook because we covered a lot of ground, and I don't really want to repeat myself today. And I think if the idea of a devil kind of freaks you out, then watch it because hopefully I reframed some kind of misperceptions around this, this so-called creature in the Scriptures. So, uh, and so this week, that was last week. This week, I want to look at the flesh. And I hope that you're ready to do a deep dive today. So let's jump to our key text, which is Galatians chapter 5. And uh, I want to start in verse 13. It says this, uh, or Paul writes this, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. And again, I want to stop there because this is why we're doing this whole series. It's not to focus on the lies or become preoccupied with the enemy, but rather to combat lies with the weapon of truth. Why? So that we might live flourishing and free. This is the promise of the scripture. It's the promises of Jesus. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Anyone who follows me will not perish, but have eternal life. And that eternal life is not just life after death. It's life that begins now. And he promises us that we will know the truth as disciples. We will know the truth and the truth will set us free. Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. But if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I mean, what a promise. So that's why we're doing this whole series. Okay, so let me go back to Galatians 5. It says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. So, so important. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you are not to do whatever you want. Now, let me just say this. The Greek word that Paul uses here for flesh is the word uh, sarx. So it's pronounced sarx. And, uh, and like many of our English words, sarx has multiple meanings. And not all of them are bad in the scriptures. Sometimes sarx can simply mean the body, as in like a physical body, like we would say, you know, flesh and blood. Sometimes sarx can mean, especially in the plural, our humanity, as in 1 Peter 1 verse 24, which says, all people are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The word people here is actually the word sarx in the Greek. Um, and so all the translations would have it, all flesh is as grass. And so in these two senses, your flesh isn't a bad thing at all, much less an enemy. It's just a word for our physicality with all its fleeting mortality and beauty. And in fact, I would say that the Bible actually celebrates our flesh in that sense, our humanity, our, our physicality, uh, as in the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, that there's actually something sacred about our humanity, something profoundly beautiful and fragile and even divine. And then there's the third and final meaning that we see in the scriptures. And this is what we talk about when we speak of the world, the flesh, 
and the devil as enemies. And it's what I want to talk about today. This is not uh, flesh as our body or as humanity. This is what Paul writes in Ephesians 2 uh, verse 3. He says, gratifying the cravings of our flesh. And here he's talking about the animalistic cravings, our base level cravings apart from God. In, in Romans 7 verse 5, he kind of further defines it as our sinful passions. Eugene Peterson, who translated the Bible into modern day English, uh, he defined the flesh as the corruption that sin has introduced into our very appetites and instincts. Basically, this flesh, it's our base, primal, animalistic drives for self-gratification, our instincts for survival, domination, and the need for control. And what I love about the scriptures is that they're incredibly open about this dark sort of underbelly of the human condition. And instead of ignoring it or pretending it's not there, we're actually invited through the scriptures to explore it under the loving gaze of God's mercy and grace and compassion. Now, just to be clear, this language or this idea concept of the flesh or this understanding of these desires within us, it's not unique to Christians. I mean, five centuries before Paul wrote these words, the Buddha said this, in days gone by, this mind of mine used to stray wherever selfish desire or lust or pleasure would lead it. Today, this mind does not stray and is under the harmony of control, even as a wild elephant is controlled by the trainer. I mean, I think this is an interesting metaphor. He's comparing his mind's attempt to reign its, its, in its desires, its passions for lust, for pleasure, for pride, to, to the challenge of riding an elephant, this giant beast. And interestingly, recently, uh, NYU psychologist Jonathan Haidt, he's a fantastic author uh, as well, he's taken the metaphor further and he, he kind of suggests that, that this is a picture of our brains, that everyone has these two sides. There's the emotional side of the brain, this is the elephant, and then there's the rational side, the rider. And the elephant is kind of all passion and desires, often on automatic pilot. It's kind of like the, the most primitive part of our brain that, you know, the part that tells us to just go ahead, eat the ice cream, you know, after the rider has just decided to put us on a diet. You know? And although the rider holds the reins and appears to lead the elephant, I think it's very clear, and he's very clear to note, that the six-ton elephant can at any time easily overpower the rider. And if you've ever lost your temper or, you know, freaked out about something, that's the elephant, you know, taking over control. And the, the point is this, for a very long time, humans have been conscious of a sort of hierarchy of desires in our minds and bodies. That, that not all desires are created equal, or at, last, at least not all of them are equally beneficial. Some of our desires are higher or nobler and lead to life and freedom and peace. Others are lower or more animalistic baseline and can lead, if we allow them to, to death and slavery and fear. And here's the even more important point. Please hear this. All healthy, free people self-edit this inner mix of desires. The wise recognize that pleasure is not the same thing as happiness. Pleasure is about dopamine. Happiness is about something far greater than just chemicals. Pleasure is about the next hit to feel good in the moment, but happiness is about contentment over the long haul. Pleasure is about wants. Happiness is about freedom from wants. Most uh, ethicists define happiness as a kind of contentment, a, like a deep satisfaction where you're grateful for what is rather than grasping or bemoaning what isn't, which means that happiness comes as the result of disciplined desire. This is the difference between freedom from and freedom for. Let me explain. You see, our culture sees freedom purely in the negative, in a sense, in, in, the, in the freedom from category. Freedom is sort of crudely defined as simply the ability to do what you want. And in this view, the opposite of freedom is, of course, constraint. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me how to live my life. Whether that comes from an external authority source, or like a government, or a, a sacred text like the, the Bible, or a binding commitment like marriage. But, but that's not Paul's view of freedom at all, and neither was it Jesus's. Their view is far more positive. It's, it's freedom for. Freedom not just to choose, but to choose the good. To choose what we want most over what we want now. And there's another word for that. 
And that word, which we don't really like, is the word discipline. But think about this. In every area of life, from sexuality to our diet to money to mental health, happiness or the good life is what happens after you discipline your desires. We have to curb some of our wants to cultivate others. As St. Augustine said, he says, the problem of the human condition isn't that we don't love. It's that we love either the wrong things or the right things in the wrong order. For example, it's not bad to love your job. I hope you do. But if you love your job more than your teenager, well, that's a disordered love and it will create all sorts of problems for both you and your child. It's the same with sex. Sex is a great God-given desire and passion. But if we get that in the wrong order, if sex becomes a God, well, that's going to mess us up. This is what the New Testament writers were referring to when they wrote about this like inner tug of war between spirit and flesh. They recognize an invisible but real battle in the deepest parts of our being. And it rages on the battlefield of our desire. Now, let's be honest. Our culture we, we kind of denies this. So we don't really like to talk about this. This is very countercultural because our culture is, and, and John Marcoma points this out in his book, it's very Freudian or very influenced by Freud. And Freud was a very intelligent man, but he also got a lot of things wrong. And his basic premise, for as far as I understand, I know I'm oversimplifying it, but is that repression of desire is pretty much the basis for our neuroses. In other words, the reason you're unhappy or I'm unhappy is because other people are telling you you can't do stuff. And, and, and I know that's oversimplified, but what's happened is that's kind of taken root in our culture. And so now we have this sort of, you know, throw off the chains. The heart wants what it wants. You know, follow your heart. You do you. Just do it. Speak your truth. I mean, as I'm reading these out, this looks like some of your Instagram feeds, guys. <laughs> um, be true to yourself. That's like the big one. And, and, and do you know where that actually comes from, that phrase? I mean, it comes from Shakespeare's Hamlet. Um, the original version is actually, uh, this above all, to thine own self be true. Um, but anyone remember who said that line in Hamlet? If you don't, don't feel bad. I only found out this week. Um, but it was Polonius, the fool. It's the fool who encourages us to live by the slogan, be true to yourself. Because we don't always know ourselves well enough or what our real needs are. We know what our wants are. And yet we mouth this mantra like it's gospel. We just assume that the way to be happy is to follow our hearts. You know? And again, there's nothing wrong with that. And it's, except that when we confuse our heart's strongest desires with our deepest desires, because they're not the same. Can I say that again? Our strongest desires are not always or actually our deepest desires. And the path to freedom is more often than not laying down our strongest desires in the moment so that we can reach our deepest desires in the long run. Not eating the cake or the chuckles so that we can look good or feel healthy. You know, it's, it's short-term pain for long-term gain. But so often we choose short-term gain and end up with long-term pain. I've done hundreds of funerals over the years and... Um, I've never heard a eulogy where the person, you know, set up, stood up and said, hey, you know what, so-and-so really got a lot out of his Tinder subscription. <laughs> or this guy's commitment to, you know, sneakers was inspiring. No, no, of course not. When people die, we honor and celebrate the best parts of their character. Love, sacrifice, loyalty to friends and family, humility, joy, service, compassion. All of which require the denial of, of fleshly desires. My point is our deepest desires, usually to become people of love and of goodness, are often sabotaged by the stronger, more surface level desires of what the Bible calls our flesh. And of course, this is exacerbated in a culture where the sort of wisdom of the day is just follow those desires. But we know this, giving into the desires of our flesh does not lead to freedom and life. Instead, it can lead to slavery. And in the worst case scenario, addiction, which as John Marcoma says, is a sort of prolonged suicide by pleasure. Bottom line, God wants us, God wants you to be free, to live free and flourishing. Please hear that. And if there are limitations or principles in the scripture that seem restrictive or prohibitive, then they're always there to increase our freedom and our joy and our peace. Not freedom from, but freedom for. 
Okay, so, so how then? <laughs> how do we fight our flesh? I mean, that's a great question. And, and I want to just give you two things today. And there's many things we could talk about. We could do a whole series on this. But, but these two ideas come straight from the Scriptures, from Galatians chapter 5, which is what we read earlier. It's kind of the key text. Um, and the first one is this. You're not going to like it. Here it is. Crucify your flesh. You say, wow, Tom. That sounds pretty hectic. I mean, take it easy, you know. But, but listen to what Paul says in Galatians 5, verse 24. He says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. In Paul's world, in Jesus' time, crucifixion, man, it was the most brutal and, and torturous form of execution known to man. And it's how Jesus died. And it's how we fight our flesh. We don't coddle it or baby it or placate it. We crucify it, says Paul. Is this not what Jesus meant when he said, pick up your cross and follow me? Or that anyone who wants to share in his eternal life, his kingdom life in the here and now and beyond must also share in his death? I love this quote by Edmund Burke. Edmund Burke was an incredible man. He was an Irish economist in the 1700s and a statesman. And he fought for justice for the poor and against slavery and he said this, and it's kind of old school language, but I, I love it. He says, men, and of course women, are qualified for civil liberty. In other words, to live a life of freedom and to lead in exact proportion to their disposition to put moral chains upon their own appetites. In other words, to restrain themselves, to crucify their flesh. He says, society cannot exist unless a controlling power upon will and appetite be placed somewhere. And the less of it there is within, the more there must be without. It is ordained in the eternal constitution of things that men and women of intemperate, and that's the word we don't use that often, but it just means lacking self-control, that men and women of intemperate minds cannot be free. Their passions forge their fetters. I love that last line. Their passion forged their fetters. A fetter is like a chain uh, used to restrain a prisoner. Think ball and chain. It's usually around the ankles. And what he's saying here is, in other words, those who have not learned to control and restrain their passions, their flesh, end up creating their own prisons for themselves. They become slaves. As Peter says in 2 Peter 2 verse 19, he says, people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. Uh, anything that has control of you, according to the scripture writers, we can be a slave to that thing. We can, whether, th we can be a, whether that's a slave owner or self-defeating behavior or an addiction to drugs or alcohol or even our phones. Those things become our masters. And Jesus wants to be our only master. And he's the only master who actually lead us to freedom and flourishing. So crucify your flesh. And, and let me just say this. This is like not a one and done deal. And it's not even some big supernatural or spiritual moment. We do this, crucify our flesh, day by day, one decision at a time. You know, over the years, I've walked a few couples through uh, an affair. And uh, it's horrible. It's hard. It's, it's, it's not redeemable. I'll say that. But it's hard. But in all my years as a pastor, I've never known anyone who just woke up that morning in a healthy and happy relationship and had an affair. In every case, that affair started with the act of, in, it didn't start with the act of infidelity, but with a thousand earlier acts. The choice to skip a date night or to quit you know, counseling or to make flirtatious comments to a co-worker or to allow a certain kind of film into the Netflix queue. The affair itself was the result of not one, but thousands of choices made over a, usually a long period of time, which then all comes to a head and brings ruin to marriages and to families. Every time we sow to the flesh or every time we give into our flesh's desire to sin, we plant something in the soil of our hearts which then begins to take root and grow and eventually, if unchecked, yields a harvest of pain and destruction. I've seen it in my own life and in those around me. But, but, Thankfully, the same is true of the Spirit. Every time you and I sow to the Spirit, every time we invest our, the resources of our minds and our bodies into nurturing our soul, our connection to the Spirit of God, then we plant something deep in our soul, which over time takes root and will bear great fruit, Christ-like character, freedom and flourishing in all aspects of our lives. We make our decisions 
and then our decisions make us. Second thing Paul writes in Galatians 5 on, on how we do this, how we fight this flesh is, he says, keep in step with the Spirit. Keep in step. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit. In verse 25, a few verses later, he says, keep in step with the Spirit. And I almost love that phrase more because there's kind of a rhythm to keeping in step with someone. You know, Jesus says in, in Matthew in, in 1 verse 28, I think from the message version, he says, walk with me and work with me. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. And I think that's what the Christian life is all about. It's not something we force or can manipulate. Um, we don't set the pace. God sets the pace. It's not our rhythm God needs to keep up with. We need to keep in step with him. And sometimes, most of the time, that means slowing down. So as we learn to fight this flesh in, in this battle that we're in, as we crucify our selfish desires and we learn to keep in step with the Spirit. I, I spoke about this a little bit last week, but for me, the primary way we do this, keep in step with the Spirit, the primary way we open ourselves up to and walk with God's Spirit is, I think, through the spiritual disciplines or through spiritual practices. And not in some legalistic way, but as a way of connecting with God who then opens up and transforms us. And, and I'm gonna, I've said this last week, I'm going to keep saying as long as I live, the Christian life is not a try harder, be better, do more life. That's religion. That's law. That's every other religion, in fact. The way we fight the flesh and win is not through willpower, because we simply don't have enough of it, but through the Spirit's power. Hello? Can I say that again? I hope you're taking notes. The way we fight the flesh is not through willpower, but through the Spirit's power. Paul in Galatians, he urges us, he says, don't try, kind of grit your teeth, white knuckle it, slap ourselves on the face, you know, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. He simply says, live by the Spirit. Now, of course, willpower is not a bad thing. I mean, in fact, I think as we follow Jesus, our capacity for willpower to choose good grows and expands. But most of us aren't there yet. I'm sure not. So if you're trying or have tried to use willpower against, you know, self-defeating behavior or whatever, some pattern of sin that you find, especially if that is rooted in trauma or past pain, and you feel like you're failing, I'm saying don't beat yourself up. Just change your strategy. It's lean into the grace of God that has been purchased for you. Instead of using your willpower to try harder, use it to practice the spiritual disciplines, disciplines like reading God's word, silence and solitude, spending time on your knees in prayer, spending time together with other Christians, serving others, giving generously. I mean, these are dis disciplines. These are practices. I mean, it's interesting that Paul says in that passage that the opposite of indulging the flesh is serving. Don't you think that's amazing? He says, do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Because there's something about serving others that gets, up, gets us out of our own heads and shifts our focus. It's like the opposite of the flesh is outward thinking. So use your willpower for these things and lean on the grace of God. As John Marcoma says, I think he says it well, he says, willpower is at its best when it does what it can, which is direct my body into spiritual practices, so that the Spirit's power can do what only it can do, what willpower can't which is overcome the three enemies of the soul. And of course, these practices are, uh, these will look different for different people and in different seasons of life. We don't do it to check the box. We do it because it's one of the ways we connect. We walk in spirit in step with God. You know, when you've got small kids, I mean, I remember that season. There ain't no such thing as quiet time <laughs> with God. I mean, let's just be real. But there are moments of connection, moments of recognizing God in the midst of bottles and nappies and sleepless nights. And if you're there, we're praying for you. <laughs> and there are other practices you can do. One practice I just want to quickly talk about before I close, because um, I think this is particularly important for, for, for the flesh, is the practice of fasting. Um, and I know you can fast from chocolate or TV or your phones, and that's great. But in some ways, that's not really fasting as the Bible primarily speaks of it. That's more abstinence. But what I want to talk about is the practice of actually going without food for a period of time. 
Um, and, and the reason I want to specifically mention fasting, because this particular practice, it, 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 Richard Foster puts it well, he says, more than any other single discipline, fasting reveals the things that control us. And you see, I don't know about you, but I know for me, we cover up what's inside us with food and other good things. But in fasting, these things surface. Maybe that's just me because I'm a big fan of food. But the very few practices have the capacity to humble us like fasting. When you begin fasting, if you've never done it before, it's common to feel sad, even anxious, or, or just plain hangry. Hello? <laughs> And we don't fast to lose weight or feel better about ourselves. We don't fast to get something from God or earn favor with God. We fast to focus on God. And I think what it does is it trains our bodies to not get what it wants, at least not all the time. Because when we're fasting, we decide of our own accord to not give our bodies what it wants, food. And so as a result, I think when, when somebody else or life decides not to give us what we want, then we don't freak out or rage or go ballistic on Twitter because we've trained our souls to be happy and at peace even when we don't get our way. And I want my boys to learn that. I want you to learn that. I want all of us to learn that. This is why fasting can be a powerful pathway to freedom. I mean, is it any wonder, think about this, that when Jesus went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil, he was fasting in the desert. It was 40 days of fasting. And I think sometimes we misinterpret the story because, you know, I, I don't know, I did for years. I, I took it to mean that the devil waited until Jesus was exhausted and weak to make his attack. But this is a misunderstanding of the relationship between fasting and spiritual power. Because actually, 40 days in, Jesus was at the height of his spiritual power. And he was able to wisely discern the devil's lies and dismiss his temptations. Such is the potential of this practice of fasting. So... I know that's a lot, but in closing, I, I just want to, I, I was kind of struck by one of the last things Paul says in his Galatians passage on the flesh. And it's in Galatians 6 uh, verse 9. He says, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I love that. I hope that encourages you. Now, I know this battle with our flesh is not easy. I know sometimes we will win and sometimes we will lose and that's okay because this is not about perfection. None of us are perfect, but we are perfectly loved. And that's really what the gospel is all about. That's why in a moment I want to invite you to take communion and maybe you're not ready for that or haven't got the elements, that's fine because we're going to play a song straight after this. And I encourage you not to just switch off what you're watching, switch off YouTube or your TV, but rather to actually go somewhere Find a space, uh, even if it's later, find a space, get you know, a little cup, a little grape juice, a little cracker, a piece of bread, representing Christ's body and His blood shed for us, broken for us and shed for us. And, uh, and take communion in your own time uh, at some time during the service or, or later today. And because it's in remembering what Christ has done, remembering that God became flesh, that His body was broken and His blood was shed for us. Remembering that he took on bodily form and humbled himself even unto death so that we might have life and have it to the full. And remember that he took on our flesh, our sin, our failure, and he lived a perfect life so we don't have to. And in fact, here's the greatest news of all. Jesus didn't just conquer the flesh and show us how to do it. He conquered all three enemies of the soul, the devil, the flesh, and the world and he tells us and he tells you not to fear he says in this world you will have trouble but take heart i have overcome the world and so just as we prepare our hearts to sing and to take communion together as you prepare your heart for that let me just say this i don't know what you're facing right now or where you may need a way out or, or maybe it's a thought pattern you just can't break free of a compulsion or addiction that's killing your joy, a character flaw that maybe leaks out in embarrassing ways despite your best efforts to nip it in the bud. I don't know, but I believe God does. And I'm here to tell you that you don't have to settle for this tug of war in your flesh because we have victory in Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you not to give up, not to grow weary in doing good, as Paul writes. For at the proper time, you will reap a harvest. Not because you're great or I'm great, but because He is great and He 
has overcome the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that victory is ours through Jesus Christ. Thank you that we don't have to fear the enemies of our soul, the devil, the flesh, and the world, because you have purchased victory for us on the cross. This is not about trying harder or doing more. It's simply about receiving what you have already done for us and then walking in step with your Spirit. So help us, Lord, to crucify our flesh, those, those, those sinful passions and desires that so easily creep up and help us to live in step with you and with your spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Sure, KG, that was an awesome word. Yeah, the series on Pretty Little Lies and just talking about the truth of God's word in, in our lives. And this week speaking about the flesh was really challenging. And thanks, yeah. Tom, for leading us in that in that space this morning. Uh, we're going to enter a time of giving in our, in our service. So if you give uh, online and via our Zappa code, our banking details uh, will appear in the bottom. So as you prepare your hearts to give, uh, we want to also thank you for your generosity and your love in, in helping us be able to take this message to different parts of the world. So as we get ready to give, uh, we're going to pray together. Father God, we thank you for the treasures that, that you've allowed us to have. Um, Lord, and we thank you that in that we can be a blessing to people around the world. And so God, we ask that uh, as people give and prepare their hearts to give, Lord, that you will bless the finances at Grace Family Church, but also um, in their own lives, Lord, that they, as they trust you in this, Lord, that you'll multiply that in their own lives, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We have our marriage and our marriage prep course that is coming up on the 8th of June. Make sure that you sign up. Uh, if you're getting prepared to get married, this is a great way for you to be able to find tools that can help you start marriage. And if you're married like myself and Wesley, I'm not married to Wesley, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to be married. <laughs> is that it's also tools that helps you to be able to grow your marriage. Make sure that you sign up and it will all be happening online. Yeah, and this week we have our podcast that would happen on Tuesday. Uh, Kerry's actually interviewing Tom and they're going to go a little bit more deeper into this topic. So don't miss that out. And then on Thursday we have uh, 10 with Tom. 10 with Tom. Yeah, so we're exploring yeah. faith 10 minutes at a time. Okay. So don't miss that out. Uh, and you can catch that on Thursday. And yeah, you can share it to people and it will be an awesome space for you to grow deeper. One of the ways that we would like to stay in touch with you is that if you're still not part of our WhatsApp broadcast list, is that if you go anywhere into our social media uh, and you send us your contacts, we'll be able to, uh, to add you into the group to, so that we can send out communication and just to keep you updated in terms of what we're doing as a community. And one of the ways that you can still stay in touch with us is to subscribe. If you're on YouTube, there's a bell, click it. It will usually pop like ding, uh, <laughs> ding, and, and there we go. Or follow us on our social media because that's how one of the ways that we get in touch and just yeah to do life together. Yeah, and speaking about social media, and for this series, we actually have a wallpaper that you can download for your uh, phone, for your desktop, for your tablet, or wherever, or share it with other people. And it's all about the series on, on Pretty Little Lies and. And it says here, the truth will set you free. Yeah. And so it's an awesome tool to have. Uh, so I want you to download it with the link below and we'd love for you to share this to people around the world. Exactly. It was so awesome to be in your homes or wherever you are. And from myself and Wesley, we love you guys and have a good rest of the week. Bye.